All right, Econ 200, let's talk about monopoly. Monopoly is the, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum from perfectly competitive markets. Remember, in a perfectly competitive market, you have lots and lots of firms, lots of buyers, lots of sellers, so everybody has to just accept the market price. Um, there's lots of information available on the profits that are being earned, and so you can um, firms can easily enter the market and exit the market if there are economic profits or losses uh, to be earned in that market. In the case of monopoly, it's going to be the opposite of that. Okay, Instead of there being uh, lots of firms, there's going to be a single firm, and that firm is going to be able to set its price wherever it likes. It doesn't just have to accept the, um, you know, the, the market clearing price. Okay, so let's start by going over a few definitions and then we're going to talk about some, uh, some types of barriers to entry. So a couple definitions to go over. First of all, what is a monopolist? Well, there's a strict definition. The strict definition of a monopolist is a firm that has no competitors. You're the only seller in that market. But this isn't particularly useful for a couple of reasons. First of all, you can have markets uh, like in the market for, um, say, the PC operating systems where Microsoft is not the only firm that sells uh, operating systems for in the PC market, but it's by far the largest firm. And especially if you would look back in the like the late 1990s, they were selling about 95% of the operating systems. There was Linux. Uh, there was uh, Apple. Okay, but for the most part, Microsoft was running the show. So most economists don't require that there be no competitors. They just require that you be a, a large firm, okay, a significant firm in the market. You don't have very many competitors. Um, a, a looser definition of a monopolist is a firm that has what we would call market power. Market power means that it can set price above marginal cost without losing all of its customers. So remember, in the perfectly competitive market, the marginal um, uh, the marginal revenue curve, the demand curve that the firm was facing was perfectly elastic. And if you set your price above your marginal cost, where that intersects the, uh, the marginal revenue curve, well, you're just going to lose all of your customers immediately. They're immediately going to go uh, find somebody else who's selling exactly the same thing that you are. But if you are a firm that has market power, that means there's something about what you sell that makes it so there's no perfect substitute, okay? So you can raise your prices and you're gonna lose some customers or you lose some sales, but you won't lose all of them, okay? In that case, you would have market power. Uh, the second definition that we're interested in is barriers to entry, okay? In order for a monopolist to stay a monopolist for a significant period of time, in order for them to be a monopolist that we care about, they have to have at least one barrier to entry. And a barrier to entry is a force that keeps out competitors. All right, so let me illustrate uh, with some children's toys. My youngest son has been asking me uh, all afternoon if I can give these back to him. Okay, I'm gonna do this with the, the Legos. So imagine this, you've got this dividing line here. If you're on this side of the line, you're in a market, you're, you're in the market competing. If you're on the right-hand side of the line, you're not in this market. You're doing something else with your time. Okay, so we've got various, uh, you know, potential firms or entrepreneurs who are currently outside of the market. And then you've got an entrepreneur who is inside the market. Okay, now right now, that firm is a monopolist. And I'm gonna represent the economic profits that this monopolist is earning with these red studs here. Okay, think of each of them as being, I don't know, $100,000 or a million dollars, whatever you like. Now, this monopolist has 10 studs to the left. Those economic profits exist in this market. You'll notice that outside here, outside the market in this area, nobody has any of those studs. None of these people are earning economic profits. They're earning you know, an amount equal to their next best alternative. So they take a look, and the story for the perfectly competitive market is, they took a look, take a look in this market, they see that the monopolist is earning all this money, and they say, hey, I could do the same thing, right? I could enter this market, 
compete with that monopolist and get some of those profits for myself. Okay, so now instead of there being 10 that all go to one firm, initially I've got five going to each of the firms. The problem is for both of these guys, when a new firm comes into the market and competes, they don't just split the profits between the two of them. When this guy comes in, he pushes the market price down. So now there aren't going to be 10 units of economic profit available anymore. Instead, because that price falls, there's going to be less economic profit to go around to be split between the two of them. Okay, so we're at this kind of intermediate period where there's two firms competing. They're not earning as much economic profit as the monopolist was, but they're still earning something. And so that is going to attract another entrepreneur into the market. Now, that entrepreneur, uh, he manages to, let's say, compete away some of their market share, but he also pushes that price down. So there's less total economic profit to go among the three of them. Okay, then you get a fourth firm entering the market. She also competes away some share of the customers, but pushes down the price. So the economic profits per firm have dropped and there's less in aggregate in the market once again. And you can imagine when this uh, fourth and final new entrant comes in, he competes away all the remaining economic profits. So now he's the guy who pushes the price down so far that he's actually not earning any more profit here than he would have at his next best alternative. Now, in a perfectly competitive market, the market is stable, right? There's no economic profits in the market. There's no economic profits outside the market. Nobody has any reason to move across this line anymore. This is the problem that you're facing if you are a monopolist who has no barriers to entry. There's nothing that you can do to prevent anyone from competing with you. So in order for a monopoly to last, what you need is at least one barrier to entry. Something that keeps out the other firms so that even if you've got all of these economic profits, right, when they come and try to compete with you, they're just bouncing off the wall. They've got no way of getting past those, uh, those barriers to entry, okay? So let's talk about what some of those things might be that protect a monopolist from competitors. Carefully move this off to the side there. Or not so carefully. All right, so here I've got a list of barriers to entry, eight of them that I'm gonna discuss uh, briefly in turn. So first of all, you've got patents or proprietary knowledge. A patent is a legally granted monopoly. The idea with a patent is if you come up with a new idea for a new innovative product or a new innovative way of producing a product, you file a patent with the federal government. And what that patent gives you is a 20-year legal monopoly where if anybody tries to produce exactly the same thing you're selling and tries to compete with you, the government will stop them. Okay, the only way that they can produce what you're producing is if they pay you a licensing fee and you get to set that licensing fee. In exchange for receiving that patent, though, what you have to do as a firm is you have to um, completely disclose exactly how to produce what it is that you're producing so that when those 20 years are up, anybody can copy you. And as soon as those 20 years are up, you're going to go from being in a, a monopoly to a more or less perfectly competitive market, okay? Now, an alternative to a patent, filing for a patent, is to maintain what's called proprietary knowledge. You have some secret ingredient or some secret way of making this product, uh, and if you can keep that information to yourself, then you can stay a monopolist in that particular market for as long as you can keep that secret. Now, if you think that you can maintain that secret for more than 20 years, well, then it's better to just stick with your proprietary knowledge than to file a patent because keeping that secret for 25 years, 30 years, uh, 100 years, that is going to be more profitable for your firm. You'll be able to stay a monopolist for a longer amount of time. Okay, Patents are a quite strong barrier to entry. Proprietary knowledge, strong, but depends on how good you are at keeping secrets and how good you are at keeping 
your employees from, from disclosing those secrets to other firms. Then you've got government privileges. Uh, this would be similar to patents, but they come usually with no expiration date. So an example that they give in your textbook is Tommy Suharto um, in uh, Indonesia. He was the son of the, uh, the president, which is a nice way of saying dictator of, uh, of Indonesia. And his father gave him a monopoly on um, farming cloves which only grow, apparently, in uh, Indonesia or mainly are grown in Indonesia. And you need those cloves to make clove cigarettes. That was a, uh, a monopoly that was just granted by the government. Now, there's no reason why um, other people couldn't farm cloves. They were just legally kept from doing so by the government. And it turned out to be a very profitable uh, monopoly. Your textbook points out a lot of people, when they hit strike it rich, they buy a Ferrari. When Tommy Suharto uh, got this, uh, this monopoly, he literally bought Ferrari. He bought the company, not a car. Okay, so government privileges, also a very solid barrier to entry. You see this in the United States as well. A lot of states, uh, for example, will, um, will have uh, utilities that are regulated. So like Southern California Edison is a monopoly provider of electricity in Southern California. Some states, I'm not sure how popular this is anymore, uh, but when I was a college student living in Michigan, the state of Michigan had uh, a legal um, agreement, I believe with Cox Cable, and no cable company except for Cox was allowed to, uh, to sell cable services in the state. Okay, and that was just a government privilege. Then you have uh, what's called significant economies of scale. This term economies of scale refers to a range of production, a, a range of, of um, output levels that a firm might have where the bigger you get, the more efficient you are. The bigger you get, the lower your cost per unit. Okay, so I've got a, a graph to illustrate for you. This is a graph that just has an average total cost curve. Okay, and notice that this average total cost curve starts pretty high, and then as the firm produces more and more units, if a firm is producing more units, they keep being able to produce at a lower and lower average total cost per unit for a very, very long time. You hit the minimum of the average total cost curve at this point, and if you're a, a, a monopolist in this firm and you, sorry, if you are a monopolist in this market, you're producing that level of, of output. If another small firm wants to come and compete with you, well, if they're only producing a small level of output, they're gonna have a real, uh, a really high cost per unit. It'll be easy for you to charge lower prices than they do, drive them out of business. And in this kind of a market, it might not be sustainable for there to be a hundred different sellers or a thousand different sellers. It could be that only one seller is ultimately going to survive. If you started with dozens and dozens of small sellers with, uh, with low levels of output and one of them gets just a little bit bigger, then that one firm is going to be operating at a cost advantage to the others. Because that firm is operating at a cost advantage, it can compete some of those other firms out of the market. As it does, it gets even bigger and its costs fall farther so it gets even more ahead of the firms that are left in the market. So you can get this snowballing effect where just one firm produces uh, at very, le very low levels of, uh, of cost per unit. That's also a pretty effective um, barrier to entry. Okay, those would be, again, significant economies of scale. Another barrier to entry would be a unique input. So in the case of Tommy Suharto, um, cloves are a unique input. They only grow in certain areas of the world. Um, again, I believe that Indonesia, at least at the time that uh, Suharto was, was president of the country, uh, was the only place where they were grown. And so there's no way of making clove cigarettes, uh, at least an exact substitute for clove cigarettes, without that input. Okay, and so if you can monopolize that input or if you're the only one who has that input, that ingredient into what you're producing, uh, then you're going to be the only one who could produce that, uh, that good. Okay, uh, then you have specific or specialized assets. These are assets that are, what, they'd be capital assets that you need for production and they are costly to attain 
but their next best use has very, very low economic value. Okay, they have very low, they're expensive, but they have low opportunity cost. So the example I always like to give of a specialized asset would be a, uh, an oil pipeline. Okay, you spend, imagine that you, you uh, decided to build the Keystone Pipeline connecting um, Canada to the United States and running down into the uh, to the Gulf of Mexico, there'd be a lot of expenses involved in that. There'd be the uh, the cost of construction, the cost of buying the right of way to uh, across all the property, the the cost of going to court with people who wouldn't sell you right of way, a uh, lot of regulatory costs. Okay, because you're crossing an international uh, border and also multiple state uh, and province borders. Uh, so it would cost you a lot of money. Now, suppose you build that pipeline and then the price of oil bottoms out, just like it did in the last couple of days. Uh, my understanding is that some, some oil sands in, um, in Canada are now trading at a negative price. Okay, They have to actually pay people to take their oil because it's expensive for them to, uh, to shut down production. So we've recently we have had crude oil prices at zero and even negative. If that happens and you come to the position where you decide, well, I need to shut down this uh, this pipeline and go out of business, well, you aren't going to be able to recoup your costs of, con of building that pipeline because the only thing it's really good at doing is moving oil from Canada to the United States. So you can't sell it off uh, at a profit or even at you know much of a... Uh, enough money to cut your losses by very much. Another example would be like a space shuttle. If you decide that you're not going to, you know, run a space shuttle between Earth and uh, and near Earth orbit, there's not much else you can really do with it other than uh, put it in a museum. Okay, so those can also be barriers to entry. If you need one of those specialized assets to get into the market in the first place, a lot of firms are going to be nervous about doing that, and they'll they'll tend to keep out. Innovation is another potential barrier to entry. Whenever you make a new product or you make a, a product that's an innovative version of an older product, you're the only one selling that good, which gives you some market power, gives you some ability to raise your prices uh, above the competition. This is why you constantly see firms like um, you know, Apple and Samsung trying to come out with, uh, with new, hotter versions of their, um, of their mobile phones, okay? They want to maintain that innovation so that people stay loyal to their brand so that they can charge uh, you know, uh, prices that are relatively high without losing all of their customers. They're trying to stay out of a perfectly competitive market. Your home landline, those phones that are produced, that's a perfectly competitive market, at least more or less. Okay, But mobile phones, because there's so much innovation in them, there's so many ways you can change them uh, to um, distinguish yourself from the competition, the, that gives those firms market power. Then you've got reputation as a fierce price competitor. This would be a situation where there's nothing special holding other firms out. Maybe you're just the first firm to get into a market and you're operating as a monopolist. But as soon as that first new entrant, that first entrepreneur comes to compete with you, you drop your prices dramatically to a level that's so low that you're losing money, but your competitor is losing money as well because he has to charge that same low price as you. And what you're betting is that you can keep your price low long enough that your competitor goes bankrupt and leaves the market, then you can ratchet your price back up to, uh, to the, the higher level. And if you do this a few times, you might get a, a good enough reputation or fierce enough reputation that other firms are just gonna say, you know what, it's not worth trying to compete with them, we're gonna go find something else to do. Theoretically possible, uh, but definitely costly in practice. And if you face a string of, of new entrants that kind of follow one after the other, you're going to be in a bad position where you have to keep dropping your prices and, and keeping them low for quite a while, and your losses are really going to uh, to mount up. So can happen, but you know, not certainly not rock solid. Finally, we have a first mover advantage in branding, which is just a fancy way of saying sometimes consumers... Um, they kind of fixate on a particular firm that's offering something and they have no reason to move on to a competitor. They just, that, that firm becomes synonymous with, uh, with purchasing that product. So a few examples of that. If you wanted to go run a web search on a term, 
we would, you know, in English vernacular, we would say, I'm going to go Google this or that uh, term, right? Well, Google is not a, is not the only search engine out there, but it is the most popular search engine out there. And now Googling is a verb that just means run a web search, okay? Well, when the, when the population of customers um, thinks of your product as sort of synonymous with, your version of the product as synonymous with just the product, that puts you at an advantage. Other examples would be if you cut yourself, what are you gonna put on that cut? Well, you're gonna probably reach for a Band-Aid, right? But again, Band-Aid is not a product. Band-Aid is simply a firm that sells bandages. It's the bandage that you're actually putting on, but Band-Aid is very likely gonna be the company that makes the bandage. Same thing with Kleenex. If you are reaching, if you need to sneeze or blow your nose, you reach for a Kleenex. Well, Kleenex is just the most popular brand of tissue paper. Uh, there are other firms out there, but Kleenex ha is this kind of advantage in branding where everybody just thinks of it as being the synonymous with tissue paper. And so it could be difficult for new firms to come in and compete with Kleenex. And the last one that I'll point out is uh, if you live in the Southeast of the United States, here in the Southwest, if you wanna offer somebody a carbonated drink, carbonated beverage, you're very likely to ask, would you like a soda or would you like a pop? That's pretty, uh, pretty common here. But in the Southeast of the United States, where Coca-Cola is bottled and where it's very popular, they don't ask you that. They say, would you like a Coke? And when someone in the Southeast, or even I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico for a few years, it was the same thing there. If somebody asked you, would you like a Coke? All that really meant was, do you want a carbonated drink? And once you said yes, they will ask you what kind of Coke do you want? And they don't mean regular versus diet. They're say, you could say, yes, I'd like a Coke. And when they say what kind, you could say, I'll take a Sprite, please. You could even say, I'd like Pepsi, right? So uh, because in that area of the country, Coca-Cola is just synonymous with a carbonated sweetened drink, it could be difficult for uh, another firm like Pepsi to, uh, to come in and compete very effectively against them. All right, so that is it for the video on barriers to entry. Um, in the next video, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna lay out the graph for the, uh, the model of a monopoly.